My name is Sean Glover. Um, like Marconi said, I, I help organize the Toronto Scale and TypeSafe uh, meetup group with, uh, with Catherine's help. Um, I also do some uh, open source work. Most of it's in, uh, or most that I have published is in Node. Uh, but I love, I love Scala. It's my favorite language by far. Um, and during my day job, day job, I'm a development team lead at Ethica, um, which is a company that that um, uh, bridges the gaps between uh, cre um, credit card issuers and and online merchants. And if you want to hear more about that, you can you can come talk to me after this this presentation or some of the people I brought along. So before I, I jump in, um, just a few things I want to cover. Uh, so a lot, of the, a lot of the tech discussed in this talk is either in beta or alpha or in some kind of experimental phase. And, and also, although I've been learning Spark for a while now, it's, it's mostly been in my, in my spare time. Um, but it has become a passion of mine. And I'm, I'm just starting to, to start to use this knowledge on the job at, at Ethica. Um, so ever, ever since uh, I got into Scala around 2012, I've been more and more intrigued in, in data processing. Um, this is an industry with tech mostly written in C or Python or Java, but an increasing number of organizations are recognizing that Scala is a, you know, a wonderful technology to build your data platform upon. And the emergence of data technologies based on Scala um, like Spark and, and things like, like ACA that you can use in your data pipeline are, are evidence of that. So in this talk, we'll uh, be talking about how to build a data streaming pipeline using Spark Streaming and, and Kafka. Um, so I, I, like, I like practical talks, so I have a couple of demos to show you. Um, the, first, the first will be about uh, uh, the first thing I'll go over is, is Spark itself and, and give a quick overview of what, what it's about. Um, and I, I have, a, uh, I have a, a demo just on batch processing with Spark. And if, if you're in the Toronto Scala meetup and you went to the one earlier this year, uh, you'll recognize it. It's the same demo I showed, and it's based on the Stack Exchange uh, data dump that they do on, a, I think, a quarterly basis. It might be more often now. Uh, next, we'll, we'll talk about what Kafka is and the Confluence stack. And I'll do a bit of a deep dive into message delivery semantics. Uh, we'll describe what Spark Streaming is and the, the Kafka Spark Streaming plugin. And if we have time, uh, there's a lot of content here, we'll, we'll go over clustering options with Spark Streaming. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to put the, the entire clustering demo together, so I'm not going to be able to show that, but I, I do have a, a um, Spark Stream demo that's working on my, my local system here. Um, if you attended my last Spark in Action talk in, at Toronto Scala meetup group, I did have a clustered environment using the Google Cloud Compute free tier, but, uh, um, and that was all free. I tried to set up um, a cluster on AWS not using the free tier, and I I got a pretty hefty bill within a few hours, so I, I, I put the brakes on that. But um, all of these things, the good thing about Spark is it abstracts the cluster away from, from uh, your implementation. So you're not going to, really doesn't matter. And I think the, the demo still, still uh, shows the value of, of Spark streaming. So what, what is Spark? Quick introduction. Um, it started as a research pro uh, project at, at Berkeley. Uh, it was announced to the paper, uh, announced to the world in a paper that describes some of its core concepts really well, and I'm going to reference it uh, more than a few times in, in the next few slides. So Spark is a general purpose computing engine for large scale data processing. Uh, Spark itself is written in Scala, um, and the Spark streaming receiver implementation is based on the, the ACA framework, actually. The main abstraction in Spark is, is known as a resilient distributed data set. And I'll, I'll read its definition from the initial Spark paper. 
Um, so a resilient, a resilient distributed data set, an RDD, is a read-only collection of objects partitioned across a set of machines that can be rebuilt if a partition is lost. So this is a cool thing about RDDs, is how they respond to failure. Um, so if, a, for example, if a, a cluster in the node dies, the way that Spark recovers lost data is, is using a technique they, uh, they call lineage. Um, so instead of, instead of fault tolerance through replication, like, like a lot of distributed systems have, um, they, they try and recompute recompute this data. So from the Berkeley paper, they have a, another description of this. So the elements of an RDD need not exist in physical storage. Instead, a, a handle to an RDD contains enough information to compute it, starting from data in reliable storage. This means they can always be reconstructed if nodes fail. RDDs achieve fault tolerance through a notion of lineage. So if a partition of an RDD is lost, it has enough information about how it was derived from other RDDs to be able to re rebuild just that partition. Uh, next, uh, the, the Spark Scala API um, allows you to implement com complex data flows that use the, the standard um, Scala collections API domain specific language that you're, you're familiar with. So you can, you can use your map and your reduce and group by filters, etc. cetera. Um, after, each, after each step in the data flow, the intermediate data is stored to, across a distributed memory store in your cluster. Um, you can also launch Spark in a modified Scala REPL, which I'll show in the first demo, um, to experiment with your data flow in the same way you would experiment with your, your Scala app. Spark is the, 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 the paper makes this claim that Spark is the first system to allow an efficient general purpose programming language to be used interactively to process large data sets on the cluster. And this, this little screen grab is just a, um, the console for the Spark uh, REPL. The version's a little out of date. I'm, we're up to 1.5.0 now, and my demos are using 1.4.1. So how is, how is Spark better than, than MapReduce in the Hadoop ecosystem? So uh, first, iterative jobs are faster. So to implement iterative algorithms, such as those needed for uh, training like machine, machine learning models, uh, with Hadoop, you're forced to flush the disk uh, and reread your data between reduced steps. So in contrast, Spark keeps this data in memory. Sure. I think that might be yeah, something happened to it. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, so, <laughs> well, uh, so in contrast, Spark uh, keeps this data in memory, which obviously has an enormous, enormous uh, performance increase if your data flow contains many steps, and most most do. Um, next. Interactive analysis. So Hadoop can be used for exploratory analysis too on, on big data sets through SQL interfaces like Pig or Hive, but uh, these operations are, are inherently slow because the data is usually still residing on disk or some kind of fault tolerant uh, persistence system. So Spark allows you to temporarily persist or, or cache a transformation or reduction to memory and then use it later in your application. And this is useful because oftentimes you want to use an intermediate step in your, in your data flow and then branch out and do several different kinds of, of computations with that. So I'll show that in my, in my first demo. And finally, the, uh, the API is very, very intuitive and, and is, uh, in my opinion, a lot more readable than, than stuff you put together in traditional MapReduce framework. So here's a, a simple dem, uh, example of a Spark driver application. So a Spark driver is the, you know, the, how you actually implement uh, a Spark app. It's just, it's, it's fairly simple. It's just a singleton um, with, a, with a main method and a few includes to bring in the, the Spark ecosystem. Uh, this example is just, yeah, 
ripped from the uh, documentation itself. And what it's doing is um, um, uh, initiali initializing a configuration where we're just setting the app name and using defaults otherwise. Uh, we create a new Spark context. And the Spark context gets, the, gets everything going. You can, you can read from uh, a text file. So in this case, it's, it's reading from the, the readme file in the Spark home directory. And what it's doing is once it, Sorry. is it running out of batteries? Um, so in this example, what it's doing is it, it's uh, reading from the file system, the readme file, and putting that, putting that into, into memory and counting the lines that contain the letter A or letter B. And the idea is this first operation will, will, will flush um, uh, this operation, the, uh, the, the um, Spark context load the text file operation. And then when you get to the, uh, the, the second line that's counting the letter B, it's already up in memory and, and the, the computation happens really fast. Sorry, everyone, for the issue with the mic. We're getting a new microphone ja just now, so it's okay. like stop, just stop. Go on pause? Okay. <laughs> um, so, sorry, everyone. Don't go anywhere. We'll get a new mic in here. While we're waiting, though, who's, uh, who's used Spark before? OK, a fair amount of people. Um, so I'm, a, I'm an amateur. There are probably some people in here that have a lot more experience with it than I do. Um, but I do, I do Splunk on it a lot. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to using it a lot at Ethica as we, as we rebuild our data ingestion pipeline. Um, and I just, just hired someone, Jay, uh, sitting over here who's uh, He's got some experience with Spark too, and he's going to be a big part of that. Who's used uh, other streaming technologies like Storm or, or Samza? Cool. Hello, how's that? New mic, new batteries. Cool. Let's try that out. No problem. Testing. So my, my first demo is uh, based on sta the Stack Exchange uh, data dump. Um, so every uh, when I when I first uh, put this together in in the new year, it was every quarter they release all of their data under the Creative Commons license. Uh, the data set contains all the Stack Exchange site posts, comments, votes, tags, and, and some other data too. It's scrubbed of all personally identifying information. And you can download it from uh, the Internet Archive. And it's, it's a BitTorrent download, or you can, you can download it directly. It's about 21 gigs uh, as of late 2014. It's probably bigger now. Um, and it's, it's basically serialized XML with one record per line. And so instead of going, I'm not going to process the whole data set. I'm just looking at stackoverflow.com and specifically the, uh, the post XML file, which is about um, 29 gigs uncompressed. And in order to, to show the demo, I, I just took a million records of that, which is around 5 gigs. So it's not a, not a huge data set, but for my limited resources here, it, uh, it does the trick. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch over to uh, screen sharing mode. Just give me a second. Um, so I'm going to boot up the, the Spark REPL. And by default, if you, you have the default logging on, you'll get a pile of messages. I, I turned all of that off. Um, and you get this nice ASCII art here. But what it does is it, it spins up a, a Scala REPL. Um, and in this shell script, I'm including, oops, 
Why did that happen? One sec. Uh, so in the shell script, I, uh, I bring in my, my example uh, app, which is just a, a jar file, um, and it spins up a, a Spark context that you can use and a, and a SQL one too if you're, if you're using that API. Um, so the first, what I'll, what I'll do first here is uh, load up, well, I'll show you in a second what it's doing, but. Uh, Um, so what this is doing is it's, it's running my, my app and it's, uh, it broke it up into to 50 jobs um, and it's running it in parallel for the four cores I have available on my system. So while that's, uh, while that's running, I'll, I'll, show, I'll show you some code here. Uh, I don't know why IntelliJ does this, but it's annoying. So this is an example row here of the, the data in the post XML file. So it has a, an ID, it has a post type, there's one or two, one's a question, one's an answer. Um, it's got the text obviously and it has these tags um, which, I'm, which I'm gonna parse, I'll show you in a second. Um, and I'm not really using the other data except for uh, creation data. So this is the, I called it the stack analysis. Uh, Spark driver app. It's just loading in the input file, so that subset of data I, I mentioned before. Um, and the first thing it's doing is getting all of the Scala questions in the post, in the post, and and in the um, uh, Scala REPL here. Um, that's basically what I did. I, I I stole some lines from the the, the start of the app to get all of these um, posts and run the Scala questions. Um, operation over over the whole data set, and then count it to get uh, to get that warmed up and in memory. So I'll show you the Scala questions here. So what it, what it's taking in, I've already loaded it in the app. Um, I have an RDD ready to go. It's just a, it's really just a iter iterable uh, RDD of, of strings. Each string is is representing a row in the uh, post XML. Um, so just doing some basic data uh, cleaning here and um, skipping, skipping lines that don't have a row item on them, um, doing an operation to parse out some of the fields in the XML. So just the ones I'm concerned with, the post type, the creation date, tags. Oh, that doesn't look so great. Sorry. Um, and, and returning that. And each, each one of these steps is returning a new RDD. Uh, with what uh, you know, with sorry, with the new um, um, types. Um, then it's uh, it's formatting the the create date string. Um, it's doing some uh, cleaning up here of the tags. So the tags look like this. They're just delimited by angle brackets. Um, so I'm parsing that out using some horrendous code here. Um, and then doing some filtering based on questions that only contain the tag of Scala, and then caching it. So, so that's the initial sort of data cleaning exercise I'm, I'm going through. And the first operation, uh, other than the count, um, is, uh, is a uh, list of the, so the, so the operation I'll show next is the most co-occurring tags that happen with Scala questions. Um, does anyone want to take a guess at what the top three might be? Probably really obvious. Um, Implicits is one. Spark. I, I don't think that's any of those are in the top three. Um, So play framework. So this is a subset of data. The, the whole data set uh, has Java at the top. It's so obvious it, it hurts, right? Um, but 
it, it's, it's fairly interesting to see, you know, it's mostly the, the type safe stack you see there, uh, people asking questions, and it's nice to see uh, Spark there too. Um, so that, that operation was fairly quick, and it, it happened a lot quicker than this initial one I did, which was loading up that initial file, right? Um, so that's the, that's the first example, and then in this other one, I'm just, uh, I'm counting the Scala questions by month. And it's taking in the same, uh, the same RDD here. And again, because it's a subset, it's just a fairly limited set of data. Um, so I won't, I won't dive into this too much, but uh, this, this project is available on GitHub. Uh, if you'd like to take a look at the tag counts implementation and the Scala questions by month implementation go nuts, it's, it's basically just more processing on the RDD and, and doing some sorting exercises. So back to the presentation. Screen. Okay, so Spark Streaming. So Spark Streaming is a micro batch streaming add-on for Apache Spark. And what a micro batch is, it's, a, it's basically a small batch of events that are processed within a defined interval of time. Uh, this this differs from data streaming technologies like Apache Storm or SAMSA, which are processing events as they're received. But one of the big, big advantages of uh, using Spark and a micro batch is that it's possible to reuse the same logic um, that you've written for batch processing. So you can, you can have some code reuse there. There's many different applications for streaming, um, but here are some of the common use cases. And Duncan, Duncan went over a few of these. but. Uh, uh, one is to, to update a machine learning model. Um, Databricks has a, a good post about using k-means in a, in a streaming application to this effect, and some of their work has been brought back into the Spark's uh, MLlib machine learning library, and you can see my reference slide for the link to that. Uh, another common use case is to detect anomalies and faults and performance problems, so maybe a Company like uh, PagerDuty could could use something like this to look for anomalous events. Um, it's a common use case. And then finally, uh, what most of us would probably use it for is to um, uh, is to aggregate data as it's arriving, um, and then persist it to downstream storage for for more analytics or piping it off to some other streaming app to to show real-time operations. And this, uh, the, these three points were, were summarized nicely by uh, Dean Wampler in his, his recent uh, white paper, Fast Data. And I got a link to that too in my, in my reference slide. So some core concepts in Spark Streaming. Uh, the initialization is, is very similar to initializing a Spark, uh, just a batch processing app. Um, you just uh, initialize the, the configuration, um, give it a master. Generally, you don't want to hard code it like this. You, you'll pass it in through uh, um, uh, environment variables or something. Um, and then the streaming context itself just takes a Spark configuration and then uh, a parameter here to um, set the interval for your micro batch. So what to, what to set this interval to really depends on the, the latency requirements of your app. It could be, it could be seconds to minutes. Uh, I guess it could be an hour if you want. And one of the core abstractions, sort of like the RDD, is to, to batch processing the discretized stream. I don't know how to pronounce it. Is, uh, is the core abstraction in Spark Streaming. 
And really, it's just a, uh, internally, it's made up of a sequence of RDDs. And each RDD represents an interval in time as defined by the interval you, you put into the spark streaming context. And you can work with the, the D stream the same way you would with, um, with an RDD. Many of the same operations are available, such as those from uh, uh, much like the, the collections DSL. Um, but there's also many stream specific operations, such as uh, sliding window operations, which I'll, I'll talk about now. So the sliding window. Um, is, a, is a neat concept that allows you to reference data in previous micro batches in order to analyze data over a larger window of time than just that one, one micro batch. Um, so for example, you might want to aggregate events to see insights of events over the last five minutes to the last five hours. Uh, there's a set of operations that, that work over sliding window data that are known as windowed computations. Uh, to illustrate the effect, um, you, you can refer to this figure, and, and it's, it's just from the uh, Spark streaming documentation. Uh, each, each window computation takes a user-defined function, as you'd expect, and two parameters. Uh, the, the window length is the, the first one, and this represents how many intervals in the past uh, you want to, want to apply a computation to. Um, and as the sliding window moves forward in time, batches that fall outside that window length are discarded from future computations. And then the second parameter is the slide interval. And this represents how often to apply the transformation or the computation. So both the, the window length slide interval are defined in seconds. And they must be multiples of that interval you defined in the initial spark streaming context. And as, as, you, as you'd expect, there's, there's a bunch of operations um, that correspond to using um, sliding window. But one that I find the most interesting is this one called reduced by key and window. So it, it's taking in a uh, user-defined function um, and it has several overloads. Uh, the, the main one doesn't have this, um, this, this second function. Um, so I'll, I'll explain what this, what this is doing. Um, the, this overload uses a inverse reducing function. So this makes the sliding window operation a lot more performant because it, it reuses computations from previous window intervals and then calculates the delta. So it does this by having uh, both a reduce function and an, an, an inverse reduce function uh, that, that performs the inverse operation. So for example, in your reduce, um, if you're doing a, a sum and addition, then in the inverse, you're, you're subtracting counts rather than, than adding them. So streaming data sources, you can use, um, there's some basic ones like just listening to a socket um, but some, some plugins that people have developed and some are maintained by uh, the, the Spark team itself are, uh, are listed here. And obviously I'll, I'll get into Kafka in a bit. Uh, there's more, being, more of these plugins being developed every day and, and you can learn about them on the Spark users group or just by checking out the libraries available in, in Central Maven repository under the, the Spark project. Let's talk about Kafka. Um, Kafka, from its documentation, is, is described as, so Kafka is a distributed, partitioned, replicated commit log service. Um, it provides the functionality of a messaging system, but with a unique design. Uh, so this is a bit of a mouthful, um, but I think it will get more clear as I, I give you a little bit of history on it. Uh, basically, it's a, it's a queue but with a different usage semantics than queues you might be familiar with, like RabbitMQ and ActiveMQ. Kafka is producer-centric, which means it's designed to handle a fire hose of messages that can be picked up by consumers at their, at their leisure. 
Their documentation describes it as a shock absorber for your system or your infrastructure, which I think is a really useful analogy. A uh, shock absorber in a car will, will dampen the effect of uneven terrain on the chassis of a car and give a smooth ride for, for the passengers inside. So we can liken passengers to systems in our internal infrastructure. Instead of having to support spiky load for all of our internal servers and applications, we can rest assured that all the data is captured in a fault-tolerant queue, and the internal infrastructure can manage its own offset in that queue. Kafka was originally developed uh, by LinkedIn, so a lead engineer of the project, Jay Kreps, uh, described Kafka as the, the central nervous system of LinkedIn. One of the principal reasons it was created was to capture all the user activity on the LinkedIn site, which I'm sure you can imagine represents an enormous amount of data that can quickly overwhelm a lot of um, traditional data processing systems. And once it was proven at LinkedIn, it was open sourced in 2011, and it was incubated by Apache and, and graduated that incubation in 2012. Um, so a lot of people probably know about Kafka, but not as many might know about the Confluent stack. So Jay Kreps um, and some of the other engineers who worked on Kafka at LinkedIn decided to start a company. They wanted to build a platform around Kafka and also start and also provide commercial support options and for enterprise. Um, so this is stolen from their documentation. And obviously Kafka is at its heart. And they have all these peripheral services and, and projects. Some of them are included in the Confluent stack. Some of these, I think, the, yeah, the red represents where a user-defined application might, might sit. So there's a lot of neat things going on here, but I'm going to focus in on the schema registry, which is on the left there. So this is a, a neat project Confluence work, is working on. Um, and it's a way to apply data validation and versioning to your Kafka topic. So schema registry itself is really just a, it's an HTTP server and it's a repository of uh, Apache Avro schemas. So Avro is a, a serialization library that a lot of people use. And the idea is you, you, have, a, um, you have a custom serializer, uh, Kafka serializer and decoder on, on the uh, consuming end that will talk to the schema registry. And it will, it will take in um, Avro records and then make sure that their schema is compatible with uh, what's, what's on file with the schema registry for that topic. And if it's not backwards um, compatible, and could potentially break your, your downstream consumers, it's going to throw exceptions. So it applies some, uh, some guarantees to your topics that you, you aren't just published, producing um, arbitrary data to them. They're, they're in a specific format. So the, the Confluent platform recently had its 1.0 release, and it's currently sitting at version 1.01. Um, but I don't know of too many people using it yet. So this is the, uh, uh, the, first, the first bit here is just the Kafka Avro serializer. So this is just a Confluent package which gives you the, the Kafka, sorry, the Avro serialization serializer and the, um, and the Kafka Avro decoder you can use on the consuming end. And then initialization is pretty much the same as, as you do normally, but you have to include the schema registry. So your schema registry has to be running somewhere in your infrastructure. And then you need to use the, uh, the, uh, the appropriate serializer, which talks to the schema registry. So message delivery semantics. Um, so in queues, in queues and databases, there's many ways to enforce different kinds of semantics. Uh, when using Kafka, we, we must consider uh, how a message is transmitted both uh, from the producer to the Kafka cluster and from the Kafka cluster, how is it consumed by a consumer. So I'd love to get the opportunity to reference Mars attacks. Sorry, how, how long? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay. 
Um, I'm going to skip through most of this then. Um, <laughs> I'll just leave that up. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me skip through this. So basically on the producer side, you have lots of options on how to guarantee that the message was received by the producer. There's, there's a bunch of different options you can use in that properties config um, to guarantee um, high durability. Um, and something that they've wanted to do on the Kafka side for a while is, is, is a concept known as item potent. So they want, they, it'd be nice to have a topic associated with a primary key so that messages that you put on to that topic are uh, guaranteed not to be um, duplicated. Um, and this is something that's currently uh, just an idea, but you should look out for it in future versions of, of Kafka. And then on the consumer side, we have some of our traditional message deliver delivery semantics. Um, probably don't need to explain these to most of you. Um, but uh, what, I, what I will highlight on is how the exactly once semantics work. So this is obviously the, the ideal semantics you want. Um, and a typical enterprise solution to this is a two-phase commit or a distributed transaction. And that, that generally involves um, a distributed transaction manager, and which is an additional component to your infrastructure. Um, so one way that, that Kafka suggests you get around this is by uh, persisting the offset in the Kafka queue uh, with the data that you're processing. And then when there's a, a failure situation, you just look up the latest data that you processed and you, you grab the offset from it, which I think is a nice, elegant way of, of handling this and, and much better than, than a distributed transaction, which requires all these things to enlist in it. It has to be compatible with whatever infrastructure you, you got, um, and you, you, know, you likely have to pay money for it. Uh, and this is what Spark Streaming does. So there, there were two implementations on how Spark Streaming worked, um, receiver and direct. So direct was the, sorry, receiver was the old one, which is based on the, the normal uh, receiver pattern. And direct basically is, uh, talking directly to Kafka and persisting, persisting offsets using the Spark Streaming checkpoint operation. Um, and this gives better guarantees. The receiver implementation could handle exactly one semantics too, but it did it in a weird way that required duplication of data using uh, what's known as the write ahead log in Spark. Um, so the direct gets rid of that. Um, and makes it, makes it a nice, cleaner implementation and less complicated. Um, finally, the, uh, the, the, the clustering stuff. So like I said, I, I didn't have time to set it up, but things you should look out for are, are Mesosphere. Uh, Mesosphere is data center operating system, DCOS. Um, you can find the links in my, uh, in my reference deck. Uh, this is a nice way to abstract uh, um, streaming operations on, over a cluster. And then the, the infinity stack I'll call out is um, a new initiative by Mesosphere that, um, that runs on DCOS and puts together a bunch of uh, common technologies for data processing. So ACA, Spark, Kafka, and Cassandra. And there's gonna be a lot of information about this coming up in 2016 and I'm sure TypeSafe will, will be uh, beating the drum about it too. Uh, so you should look out for that. So final demo. Um, so instead of using Stack Exchange data, I, I decided to use the GitHub Public Events API, um, which is which has got like a ton of ton of real time data on, on what's going on in GitHub. Uh, so there's generally about 100, 200 events per second. There's lots of different types. Um, unfortunately, it was tough to get set up because it's inconsistent with its documentation and the, the key that I use to access it is limited to 5,000 requests a sec, uh, per hour. Um, but they gave me a green light to, to demo it. Um, so what I'll do here is I'll, I'll get my scraper. So this is just a dispatch client that's um, polling uh, the, the GitHub events API. Uh, it misses a few events regularly because it can't keep up. But, but it gets most of them. And then my Spark streaming application, which I, I probably won't have time to show you, but I'll just show you the end result. Um, this is going on an interval of two seconds. Um, 
and it's uh, publishing to Mongo, which is, uh, has a neat feature for streaming called Tap Collections, which I won't get into. Sorry, you're not seeing anything I'm doing. Uh, just give me a second. <laughs> Let me mirror my display again. Sorry, I was just starting these up, these two jobs up. Um, and I'll just show the uh, resulting app here that I put together, I hacked together. So this is just a, a visualization of um, events that are happening on GitHub per language. And it's, it, you know, there's not much to it. And in a, in a small sliding window of about five minutes, which is what I set, uh, you, don't, you don't get too much insights. But this is just an example of, of what you can do with uh, streaming technologies in general, and especially Spark. And, um, yeah, if, if you want to check out the actual example, just download my, my Learning Spark uh, GitHub repo. Um, oops. And that's, uh, that's it. So, references. Um, yeah, that's it. I don't know if we have time for questions, but uh, uh, thanks for, for listening to me.